I'm assuming most of you have no idea who Charles and Ray Haynes are. They're not brothers, they're husband and wife. She had a very funny name. Um, the Ameses were a highly unconventional couple. They enjoyed taking their ideas to new extremes. Um, Ray was educated as a painter and Charles was an architect. They each saw design as an extension of their um, talents. So Charles saw design as architecture and Ray saw design as painting. Um, their motto was create the best for the most for the least. Everything they did can be viewed through this motto. Um, their chairs were an attempt to move good design into suburbia at the lowest possible price. Um, the research questions I focused on in my paper were why do these chairs exist? What does their creation reveal about suburban values? Why plywood? And why did the Eameses obsess over the plywood? <laughs> Um, the Eames has started with this chair. It's a very radical chair for the time. It was designed in 1941. And the most important thing about this chair is, is he met Ray while working on it. <laughs> the Eames's first collaboration happened at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. You can see Charles on the left of that photo and his um, then design partner, um, Aero Saarinen. They entered their design into the Museum of Modern Art's industrial design competition, and they ended up taking first place. Um, Charles and Arrow, with the assistance of the students at Cranbrook, produced the organic design chair. According to a designer who knew the Eames and, who knew Eames and Saruman, the goal of the chair was to produce an inexpensive chair which is well designed and which is molded to the body so it doesn't need a lot of upholstery, which is A, old fashioned, and B, expensive. Not upholstering the chair required that the polywood shell contour perfectly to the body. Otherwise, pressure points would develop and make the chair uncomfortable after long periods of use, which I'm sure you're all aware of now. <laughs> <laughs> the compound curve in the plywood proved to be very difficult in achieving. They ultimately failed, and they had to upholster the chair and cut a hole in the back so that it would not splinter during the manufacturing process. Um, Technology wasn't quite as advanced as they would have liked it, so Charles decided to leave Cranbrook and take Ray with him to develop the chair. Shortly after winning the competition, he asked Ray to marry him as he was planning to leave for California. In what has to be one of the most honest marriage proposals of all time, Charles tells Ray, I am 34 years old almost and single again. I would love to marry you, mar I would love to marry you very much and would like to see you very, very soon. I cannot promise to support us very well, but if given the chance, I'll sure and help try. And down at the bottom, next to a little drawing of the hand, he asks, what is the size of this finger? <laughs> After their marriage, the Eameses continued their work in experimentation with molding plywood in the months before the war. In their small apartment, they molded shells using various methods, but none really proved satisfactory. In their Los Angeles apartment, the pair, after years of trial and error, invented the machine and process that could bend plywood in the way they needed. They called it the Kazam. The Kazam both heated and applied pressure. The pressure was achieved through a bicycle pump, which the pair pumped in turn. When war broke out, materials began to be rationed for the war effort. They had put their goal of molding a complete plywood chair on hold. This material scarcity forced Charles and Ray to look into other avenues of applying the technology they needed to develop. They eventually found the answer to their problems, the U.S. Navy. Ray explained how they came to the idea of splints. She said, we began by talking to an old friend of Charles's and heard about this terrible condition. The leg splints that were being used were metal, a scarce material. The Navy was in need of a less rationed, more hygienic, and less expensive splint for their wounded. The Eames is in need of a patron for their experiments, sold them on the idea of molded plywood splints. And the Navy placed a test order for 5,000 splints. Following the tooling up process for the tooling up process for the molding of the splints, Charles filed for a patent in which he skillfully included the line, one object of the invention is to provide an improved surgical splint. Another object is to provide an improved chair. He did this to protect his rights for molding chairs after the war. As soon as their contract with the Navy was over, Charles and Ray went back to the chairs. They created the Eames Lounge Chair Wood. The LCW was produced by the Herman Miller Company from 1941, and it is still in production today. It is the perfect example of the Eames, the Eames's designing for the masses. The LCW is one of the most well-recognized designs of the Eames's. When viewed from any angle, only wood shows. No fasteners, nails, screws, or bolts are visible. Making the chair appear to be pure wood was an act of design genius. 
The solid wood appearance gave the chair a higher prestige. The Eameses knew that no fashionable person in suburbia would pass a piece of cheap plywood as furniture, because plywood furniture then held the same level of sophistication as it does today. The Eameses had to design a flawless chair that could, that could surpass the reputation the material was made from. To conquer these long-standing feelings against plywood, the Eameses simplified and distilled the chair into its purest shapes and forms and made, according to Time Magazine, the greatest design of the 20th century. The lounge chair wood was debuted at the Museum of Modern Art in an exhibit made completely of Eames pieces. It was the first ever one-man show of the industrial design department. Contemporaries of the Eameses were astounded by the genius not only of the design, but of the structural and manufacturing solutions the Eameses created. According to Ray, many people were afraid to sit on them, but we had them out. It's hard to think of now, but we were just not used to sitting on anything as thin as that. The image shows one of the exhibits at MoMA. To showcase the durability of the chair, the Eameses had one tumbled in a drum 24-7 for three months. <laughs> the chair did not break once, the drum broke twice. <laughs> in addition to advocating relentlessly for modernist design, the modernist designs of the Eameses, Life and Time magazines answered one of the research questions directly at the core of this paper. Life answers the why to the why mass produced more with the plywood. They said, to a U.S. almost as short of good and inexpensive furniture as it is of houses, the chairs and the modernist designers offer hope. After years of working on getting their chairs in the middle class suburban homes, they finally succeeded with the Model 670. This is the chair that people think of when they think of the Eameses. With its sleek lines and almost sensual curves, the 670 drips luxury. The Eameses chose to debut the 670 on NBC's film show, bypassing the reporters of Time and Life magazines and they took their chair, chair directly into the suburban home. Arlene Francis, the host, opens the show with the LCW, acknowledging the success of the chair. She states, the LCW was first introduced to the public at the Museum of Modern Art, an exhibit made entirely of Eames pieces. Since then, many more styles of the original have been designed. Towards the end of the segment, they introduced the 670. A visibly excited Charles cannot wait to sell his new chair to suburban wives watching at home. Charles ingeniously shows a pre-recorded video of the assembly of the chair. In five to ten minutes, the chair appears from a pile of parts, selling the ease of the assembly of the 670. Marketing and advertising like this pushed the Eames into the homes of the middle class and upper middle class people they set out to target with their designs. Debuting the 670 on NBC's home show was the Eames' best attempt to cater to suburban housewife. It was an hour-long, daytime, women's-oriented show. By creating programs specifically for the housewife, the television networks tapped into the droves of women who worked in the home. The Eameses were trying to maximize their exposure to the decorator and purchaser of the house. By debuting the chair on the home show, Charles and Ray found a way to market their chair directly to the people who would buy it. Today, the 670 is still available at the slightly less affordable price of $4,500. <laughs> um, to, to look at the success of the 670, you only have to look at popular culture. It can be seen in um, TV from Fraser to House, and Charles and Ray are everywhere. If you've been to Norfolk International Airport, you've sat in Eames chair. If you've been to any bank in the Western United States, you've probably sat in an Eames chair. Charles and Ray use their designs to proselytize their ideas, culture, and values to the American <laughs> consumer, trying to usher in the better world they envisioned. Using technology they developed during the war, the Eames has created these radical new designs. These designs started in 1941 with the organic design chair and continued into the 670. They created chairs that they intended to be perfect for middle class suburban consumers. The Eameses then attempted to market these chairs to, sur to suburban consumers, first in print and later in television. The Eameses also used the plywood chairs they designed to fulfill their perennial design goal of creating the best for the most for the least. Thank you.